everybody to the program tonight. Uh, my name is Natalie Fritz and I'm the archivist and director of collections outreach and social media for the Clark County Historical Society. And today's program, um, we wanted to do something in honor of um, the 80 years since our um, America's uh, forced entry into World War II as um, yesterday was the um, 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And um, Throughout the year, we've been talking about, you know, different different things that we might be able to do, um, knowing we're going to still be doing a virtual program. And um, this one came about because the two gentlemen that are our guests tonight, um, Manly Irwin and Paul Metz, were people that I spoke to on the phone because um, they contacted the research library about uh, research that they were doing. And it um, ended up, you know, over time turning into, hey, do you have, you know, some, uh, you know, you have these stories that you can talk about. So we thought that um, the way we would approach uh, the program tonight is to share just a few uh, locally connected Clark County, uh, Springfield and Clark County stories that are connected to World War II uh, throughout our collections and throughout the archives and throughout the county. There's hundreds of thousands of stories of people that have, you know, um, that they served or their grandparents served or their great grandparents served. So, um, we make it our mission to try and collect and preserve the history of our county. And, you know, I was connected with these gentlemen because they, you know, were hoping that we would have something that would help them um, in their, their research that they were doing. So they'll, they'll both be sharing some stories tonight and we'll talk a little bit more about some local connections. And um, later we'll encourage you guys to, to jump in and maybe share some stories or ask questions. Um, but I wanted to first uh, introduce our two uh, guest speakers tonight. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Manly Irwin, who uh, initially had contacted me uh, to help with some research that he was doing about Admiral Williams, who you'll hear a, a lot more about. Um, Mr. Irwin uh, researches and writes on U.S. naval history, but he was an emeritus professor of economics from the University of New Hampshire. His research interests include history of the U.S. and British naval warfare and the development of U.S. naval logistics during the early 1920s. He's the author of a monograph on naval policy and of the Harding administration and many articles, has done conference papers, um, book reviews, and more. So, um, our other guest speaker tonight is Alfred Paul Metz, who was born in Springfield and received his bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from the Ohio State University. He enlisted in the U.S. Air Force in 1968 and flew operational missions in the U.S. and South Asia and flew 68 missions over North Vietnam and took part in the pivotal 111 days of Christmas raids in December 1972. In 1978, he became an instructor pilot at the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School in Maryland. Uh, he later joined Northrop Aircraft in 1980 as an engineering test pilot and was later appointed chief test pilot. He spent two years as an uh, engineering test pilot on the B-2 bomber program before leaving Northrop to become Lockheed Martin's chief test pilot. He's now retired and I was recently connected in while he was working with the National Trail Parks and Recreation District doing research on veterans as part of Veterans Park Memorial uh, that they've been working on the last several years um, <laughs> down by Buck Creek. And uh, he's, and then we connected about a research inquiry that he'll share more with later that's unrelated to the topic that he's uh, talking about tonight. So um, before we get into the stories, uh, I. As with all of our other Zoom programs, this one is being recorded. Um, I will will mute um, the the participants now that are that are not uh, speaking right at the moment. Uh, but you guys will be able to unmute and ask questions. Um, make note of anything that you have through the, the first the two presentations, uh, and then we'll we'll have things open for discussion later. If you want to put anything in the chat, the chat function, um, if you're on a computer, should be uh, buttoned down at the bottom, and we'll keep track of those. Especially if you have questions that pop up through the presentation, yes, put those in the chat. Yeah. So without further ado, um, Mr. Irwin, I'd like to. Uh, invite you to, to share the story that you have for us tonight. And you can Thank just you. let me know as you want me to um, advance the slides. All right. At the end of World War II in the Pacific Theater, U.S. Naval officers interviewed their Japanese counterpart. They asked questions about engagements, tactics, logistics, and various uh, war experiences in the Pacific. Japanese officers 
at least a couple of them, observed that the U.S. fleet came, quote, sooner than we expected. That quote obviously was a tribute to the strategy and the tactics of the U.S. fleet during the Second World War, but also reflected the thinking of Admiral Clarence S. Williams, who set the tone of that strategy back in the 1920s. Next slide, please. When you think of Admiral uh, Williams, four questions come to mind. First, what was his experience in, as a naval officer? You want to turn Second, it what impediments did he face and confront in any war with Japan in the Pacific? Third, what strategy did he offer and recommend for the fleet in the event of a, of a uh, Japanese war? And third, or rather fourth, how did his thinking and strategy influence the Navy's performance in the Pacific War? New paragraph, new, uh, new sl slide. A first <laughs> burden or obstacle to Fletcher uh, Admiral Williams was a map of the Pacific drawn in colors. The colors reflected the codes of various countries, blue meaning the United States, and this is red, but it should be orange representing Japan. And in the middle was a neutral area in which the fleets would clash and begin their engagements with each other. The map reflects a great deal of distance between the US uh, West Coast and the Japanese islands on the far east, or in this case, the far west. Uh, some seven to 8,000 miles resided between uh, San Pedro or San Diego and Yokohama. And the question was, how does the US fleet negotiate 8,000 miles when the distance between New York and California was 3,000 miles? One uh, proposition was to send the fleet from the US West Coast, refuel at Pearl Harbor, engage the Japanese fleet in their area of uh, control, and of course prevail in that engagement. A second thought, uh, and this was reflected in uh, the thinking of Admiral Williams, was that there was no base to per uh, permit that uh, engagement, and therefore the fleet would have to take an enemy held base and convert it into an advanced base and step by step negotiate the vast expanse of the Pacific. Now this map was drawn in 1915 by a naval officer who was with the general board, which was an advising group to the secretary. And you'll note that on the east side, there, the US had a blue area that went from Alaska to Hawaii to Panama. And then there's an inner uh, defense position between Bremerton, Washington, Pearl Harbor, and San Diego. Uh, so that was the that was the layout. Uh, Japanese was code word was orange, and therefore orange and blue uh, proposed as the spheres of control within the Pacific. Uh, next slide. A second uh, impediment to the Pacific was the Versailles Treaty, which was uh, promulgated in 19, 1919 after the First World War. The Versailles Treaty handled uh, the Germans a bill of uh, cost because the Allies said they started the war. But more important, the Japanese were awarded the Micronesian islands that were former Germany island, German islands of the Marianas and the Carolines. Those islands resided between Hawaii and the Philippines. And the United States, as a result of the Spanish American War, had guaranteed the Philippines independence. So the question was, how could the Navy ensure that independence if Japanese islands resided between the fleet and in between the Philippines? New paragraph, well, this is it right, let's stay right here first. This is, and this is the third impediment or problem of negotiating the, uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean. 
The Harding administration took office in 1921, having won the election in 1920. They inherited a naval construction war between former allies, Japan and Britain. Uh, both were building up their fleets. And the Harding administration said, why are our allies fighting each other? So they formed and held a negotiation in the, uh, in the West Coast, actually uh, in Washington, DC, and arrived at a tonnage assignment on battleships and carriers. Britain and the United States attained parity of that, sun, that tonnage assignment. Japan's was quite uh, less by some 40%. Japan asked then that, that the United States move its fleet away from the Japanese islands. And Japan, rather the United States agreed not to build or fortify a base west of Pearl Harbor. The British agreed to transfer their Asian fleet from Hong Kong to Singapore. Now those islands uh, were part of a League of Nations mandate to Japan, but they sat also between the United States, Hawaii, and uh, the Philippine Islands. And the question was, how do we uh, overcome that obstacle? Next slide, please. The Washington Agreement threw naval war plans into a tizzy because they were assuming, making certain assumptions of having bases in the Pacific. The Washington Agreement thus is largely controversial and what is often forgotten is this list of ships that were excluded and outside the tonnage requirements of that agreement in 1921-1922. And if you look at that list, it's made up of uh, cargo ships, uh, distilling ships, hospital ships, tar uh, dry docks, tugs, uh, mine ships. These ships are outside and can be built uh, to the discretion of either party, particularly the United States. Uh, next, next paragraph, please, or next, uh, next slide. When the Harding administration took over, uh, Harding appointed a Detroit industrialist by the name of Edwin Denby. Denby was a uh, Marine reservist. And the first thing he heard, and he heard from uh, uh, Admiral, um, uh, uh, Williams, that the fleet was split between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Williams said, the next adversary is Japan, concentrate the fleet on the Pacific. And so that was done. The second thing that was done was the fleet was divided into the battle fleet, scouting fleet, control force, and base force. The battle fleet were heavy warships uh, backed up by cruisers of the, of the scouting fleet. The control force took care of uh, submarines and the Marine Corps, and the base force was the supply ships or auxiliary vessels. Uh, next slide, please. Williams was now wedded and had sold uh, the department on the essential view of moving across the, the Pacific by island hopping. And when John Lejeune, who was head of the Marine Corps, who had fought in France with the American Expeditionary Force, came back to the United States. He looked at the Pacific and he said, we have no bases. The new doctrine of the Marine is to take a base, an enemy held base, and convert it into an advanced base. That base then would serve as a hopping off point for the next base. Well, Lejeune and Williams now saw eye to all eye on a strategy for the Pacific. Next slide. But June's assistant was a Lieutenant Commander Earl Ellis. Ellis had served for Le June in uh, the Philippines, and now he was his aide and assistant in, back in Washington. Ellis was convinced the next adversary for the US was, was Japan. And he wrote a 200 a page diagnosis of the requirements, the equipment, the hardware, the strategy, the tactics of how to have the Marine Corps move across the Pacific into the Marianas. Ellis then took off his uniform, took a leave of absence and visited those islands as a uh, pedestrian or as a tourist and took notes 
and looked at the topography of both the Marianas and the Carolines. But he died unexpectedly and no one knows why. But he left that doctrine, which now became part of the Navy and part of the Marine Corps. Next slide. The Marine Corps decided to test him, to test their a doctrine of landing and assaulting an enemy held island. So they started landing exercises in 1921, 1924, at an island of Culebra, which is right next to Puerto Rico. And here is a ship that they were landing craft, they borrowed from the British, and they jumped in there and tried to try out how, in, how they would learn to take a, an assaulted island by the frontal assault. The, um, uh, the ship was used, and of course, to, to, you can see the Marines were get, getting wet, and the, the Marines now decide how do we get ashore without uh, getting our, our whole uniform damp. And they carried on in this in this these exercises uh, attempts to develop re <coughs> refueling ships at sea. They asked the uh, Navy for uh, battleship gun support. They also employed close air support by planes. Uh, they developed radio links to try to coordinate the operation, and they take, took note of the lessons learned and the lessons that should be avoided in trying to assault an enemy held island. The, one of the requests that they made after these exercises, I might add that they put a, the Marine officers put a plan of the Japanese islands over Culebra, simulating what it would be like to take a Japanese defended position. The Marines at the end of those exercises said, you know, we need support from battleships. Now that was heresy, asking a battleship to become an affiliate of the Marine Corps in order to take an enemy held island. And the Navy uh, really brushed that off. At the same time, next slide, I guess you can try it. Next time, uh, I might add that, uh, that the Marines were not part of a organization called the Joint Army Navy Munitions Board, which was created in around 1900. That was the premier war planning for both services, Army and Navy. And uh, the Marines were not represented on that. Admiral Williams assigned a Marine to a planning committee that set the agenda for the Army Navy Munitions Board on the premise at least they would consider amphibious operation as a tactic and as an option in the Pacific. Now, this is a letter that Warren Harding wrote to a senator saying that the most important piece of legislation I want to offer, I'm a president, is to increase the efficiency and the economy of the merchant marine industry. Next slide, please. The president proposed to a uh, legislation with two subsidies. One subsidy was given and uh, assigned to shipping companies, uh, Ford Motor Company, US Steel, Standard Oil of New Jersey, uh, Lumen Company of America, all had their own fleet to encourage them to buy modern ships uh, that would keep up with the fleet, but more important, would be could be used as auxiliaries for the Navy, uh, Navy uh, uh, Department. A second uh, subsidy it was awarded to private shipyards if they adopted and made these uh, new modern uh, merchant ships that also would be converted into naval auxiliaries. And the Harding appointed a presidential uh, committee to lobby Congress as to the merits of his program. And who is on the left side of this, the second to the left? Admiral Clarence Williams. Williams served on that. And the reason he served on that was he, he recognized that the Merchant Marine was the ultimate source for getting across the Pacific and having a mobile base and island hopping. Next slide. By the way, the Senate killed the program and the House killed the program by, uh, the Senate killed by a filibuster. Now notice what this list is again. The list that was left open in the Washington Arms Agreement is the list that would be included in the ship subsidy program, but it died in January, 1923. New paragraph or new, new, new slide. The next step was, uh, was oil. Uh, 
at the turn of the century, most warships were fueled by coal. Coal was tough. It had dust. It was dirty. Uh, it was You had to transfer bags from one ship to another, a collier to a, a warship. And in 1906, the British Admiralty announced a new warship, the HMS Dreadnought. The Dreadnought was 20,000 tons, six inch guns, fueled by oil and capable of a speed of 20 knots. The HMS Dreadnought rendered most ships obsolete. The United States Navy said, we are going to match that, but do we have sufficient oil in the United States? That question was posed to the Interior Department, which ran 17 million acres and was ran the public, 17 acres of public land. The Interior Department calculated the demand for oil in the United States and the supply and came to the conclusion that the United States will run out of oil in 20 years. Now that was happened under the uh, William uh, Taft administration. And Taft in 1910, by executive order, set aside two oil reserves in California. Those reserves were for the Navy. And five years later, President Wilson, during his tenure in office, set aside a third oil reserve, NPR3, in Wyoming. And those, and uh, William's plan was to, as part of his offensive plan on the Pacific, was to build oil tanks along the East Coast and at Pearl Harbor, and also to place oil tanks on the, on the West Coast, I'm sorry, on the West Coast in Pearl Harbor and on the East Coast, as far south as Panama. And here is a, a figure or a photograph of the construction of those oil tanks. Uh, there's another photograph. You want to take another one uh, uh, on that construction? It's full of pipes. It has drilling. Uh, and it was uh, uh, quite, a, quite an exercise. And this was the source of the reserve oil as a logistic support system for the fleet. The Navy now enlisted the help of the Interior Department because the Interior Department had the Bureau of Mines, the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. They understood oil. They ran public lands. And they asked the Interior Department to negotiate this uh, oil well and drilling and reserve with the Pan American Oil Company, headed by a gentleman by the name of Edward Doheny. Doheny had a nose for oil. He, he discovered oil in, in, the, in California. He discovered oil and set up refineries in Mexico. He discovered oil in Maracaibo, Venezuela, and he had a large fleet. And Doheny and the Pan American Oil Company began to negotiate with the Interior Department. And as part of that, the Secretary Denby assigned a naval officer by the name of John K. Robinson, who was head of the engineering. Engineering dealt with oil and machinery. And Robinson's job was to uh, act as liaison with Interior on these oil leases. Denby instructed Robinson, the first thing you must do is adhere to the war plans of uh, Clarence Williams. So uh, Robinson, rather uh, Williams, began to calculate and recommended that there be, should be 17 oil tanks placed at Pearl Harbor. Then he recalculated, by the way, he's, he graduated in the top 10% of his class and he was a math quiz. Then he calculated the requirements of the fleet and said the 17 tanks are insufficient. We need eight more tanks at Pearl Harbor. And uh, the job of deciding where to put those tanks was easy. We'll simply expand the upper tank farm. The yard in charge of building those, uh, and finding the uh, situation, the Bureau of Yards and Dogs uh, said, uh, we will expand that 17 tank uh, allotment, but they ran into poor soil condition. And the cost rose and they, they decided to look for an alternative location. They spotted a section of the Marine Corps reservation and said, we'll put the eight tanks, additional tanks there. Well, John Lejeune said, went crazy. That's, we need that land for landing on enemy held islands. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Navy or William said, we've got to have those eight oil tanks. 
And uh, it finally went to Secretary Denby. And Denby, who was a Marine reservist, said the war plans of, of Williams supersedes even the Marine Corps. And those oil tanks were built and this became known as the lower tank farm. Then Williams said, we have to have aviation gas. And there was an island called Ford Island, which was jointly managed by the Air, the Air Force and by the Navy. And they put up aviation tanks there. Then as if that was not done, before the negotiations were done with, with Pan Am, uh, Williams said, it's still not insufficient oil. And I want seven concrete barges loaded with oil taken and docked at Pearl Harbor. And the question was, why? Well, the oil, it, if we're getting oil for the United States, it's got to be refined, it goes through a pipeline, it's got to go to a, 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 a storage facility. It'll take day, nine months for oil, and I want oil immediately because Pearl Harbor is a priority. And so that was, that was, uh, that was done. New paragraph, new, new, uh, new. Now the second, uh, by the way, on the left side, you'll see all this uh, uh, oil construction and the Pan Am and uh, the oil leases in oil reserve number one and two. Now there was a second company that the Interior Department under Naval Advisement managed or rather uh, negotiated with, and that was the Mammoth Oil Company uh, under the leadership of Harry Sinclair. Harry Sinclair was a pharmacist, but somehow he got in the, nail, in the oil business and a large tank farm drilling and, art, and uh, refineries. And he was approached to lease the oil tank three farm in uh, a, a reserve in Wyoming. Robinson looked at that and said, that doesn't do any good in Missouri. We have to have these oil tanks stored on the East Coast. So he pressured the man with oil company to build an 800 mile pipeline to the center of the US and then link into our, uh, refineries and storage tanks on the East side. And uh, the question was, why do you want that pipeline? Well, Robinson had participated in the First World War. And he said that in the First World War, we had such a backup and, uh, of, of the uh, New York Navy Yard and New York uh, uh, shipping yards that we had to ship uh, our ordnance and supplies and material down to Savannah and to uh, Jacksonville in order to get them over to Europe. A pipeline serves as a substitute for an oil tank car and for a uh, rail tank car. So the oil company agreed to do that. And that was the second uh, negotiation that took place. Next slide, please. Now comes the story of Albert Fall. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior. He ran the, he ran the Bureau of Mines, the Bureau of Land Management and the US Geological Survey. Fall was now in charge of the Interior Department. And that by this time, Congress began holding hearings on the oil and the oil reserve program. And the head of the hearings was uh, Senator Thomas Walsh of, of, of Montana. And uh, Walsh collected information, documents, reports, maps uh, from both sides, the Interior and the Navy Department, and started having hearings in the fall of 1923. And the first witness was Albert Fall. And he asked Fall all kinds of questions about oil. Well, Fall was very conservative, uh, uh, conversant with oil. And uh, he answered with authority and uh, detail. And uh, his answers were almost bordered on a uh, tutorial on, on petroleum. At one point, Fall was asked, did you accept any money from the oil contractors? And Fall said, no. That was in 1923. In January 1924, Edwin, Den, uh, Edward Doheny, who testified earlier, came back and stated on the 24th, I lent Albert Fall $100,000. He's a friend of mine. That testimony was exploded. The US Senate voted to cancel oil leases on the basis of fraud, but that loan was a payoff and a bribe. Second, the Senate passed a resolution ordering the resignation of Albert, or rather Edwin Denby, as Secretary of the Navy. He permitted Fall to do that. Next, the uh, Secretary or the uh, 
uh, Congress um, passed a resolution to create two prosecutors to file suits against the, the oil companies. And those suits went on into the 20s, even into the 30s. And the long and short of it was that Albert Fall eventually had to plead the fifth and he was convicted in court and sentenced to a year in prison and fined $100,000, period. Now, the problem with Albert Fall is regarded as one of the great uh, uh, scandals of US history. But um, in the process of going after Albert Fall, the US Senate canceled the oil leases and voted against, at the same time, uh, the oil, or rather the ship subsidy program that had been sponsored by Williams and by the President, the President Harding. So what, what happened was that the logistics of the Navy began to suffer because of Albert Fall's uh, misconduct. And uh, this began to uh, affect the whole premise of a mobile base force across the Pacific. Next slide, please. The uh, President will, uh, President Coolidge moved rather quickly after the scandal. It was in his, under his uh, jurisdiction. So he secured the resignation of Edwin Denby. He secured the resignation of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the son of the former president. He transferred uh, 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 Admiral Robinson to the New York shipboard and then went uh, the uh, New York Navy Yard. And when Robinson took retirement, he reduced his rank from rear admiral to captain. And then of course, uh, 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 Coolidge appointed two prosecutors to file civil and, and uh, uh, criminal suits against the two oil companies. The status of Williams' war plan now was in shambles. The Navy had closed down the oil reserves. The Senate had, de had denied a subsidy for fleet and for new merchant ships. The uh, prosecutors went after the uh, various Navy Yard uh, personnel who supported uh, the leases. And the, uh, even the US Naval War College canceled courses in naval logistics. Uh, so what, Wall, what, what Williams was faced was with the loss of logistics, a loss of a mobile base, a loss of supply, and a loss of credibility uh, with his war plans. But he had one card in his hand. He had served on USS Ossipee, which is an old warship, a uh, wooden warship that had experienced and had participated uh, long before uh, Williams had served on it. It had served in the Civil War and had acted as a uh, long Mississippi Mississippi River to interact and to block any supplies from Texas to the Confederacy. The next ship that he, that, uh, that uh, um, Williams served on was the USS Gwynn for a year, 1888-1889. The, the, the function of the Gwynn during the Spanish-American War was to impose a blockade on Cuba. Next slide. Here is a letter written in 1921 by Admiral Williams to the Naval Intelligence Service. He's asking the Naval Intelligence Service, I want a list of Japanese merchant ships. I want a list of their voyages and their routes. I want a list of Japanese harbors and yards. And I want a profile of Japanese imports of raw materials. What 
Wilson, Williams did was he defined Japan as an island subject to economic embargo. That was the legacy he left. And this was in 1927 when the Supreme Court upheld the fact that, that the whole oil reserve was fraudulent, it was fraudulent and was, uh, was illegal. It was the year that uh, Williams had to retire because of his age, but he left that legacy. Next slide. And we'll, we'll move on to that. We'll, we'll move on just for the sake of brevity. We'll move on to the next slide. Now in 1940, France began to fall to the Germans. And the Navy began to say, you know, we don't have sufficient oil in Pearl Harbor. So they contracted a company called Morrison Knudsen and put Virgil oil tanks near Pearl Harbor to supplement the oil reserves and oil storage facilities of Clarence Williams. The, it would hold 6 million tons. It would be available uh, by 6 million gallons. It would be available in 1943. Next, next, uh, next slide. January 7th, uh, uh, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack. They damaged eight warships. Two were able to be survived. And it was, uh, the, the casualties were something on the order of 2,500. Uh, new paragraph, next, sli next slide. What the Japanese missed, however, was the oil tank farm on the left. You see that? That's the upper tank farm. And if you look over the very far left, that's a lower tank farm. Those are the tank farms that were sponsored by Admiral Williams. The Japanese missed that. Admiral Nimitz testified after the war. Had the Japanese sank those oil tanks, the U.S. would have had, moved, had to move the Navy back to 2,200 miles east of the West Coast because there had been no logistics supply here in Hawaii. And as a result, the failure of the Japanese to destroy those tanks, uh, had they destroyed them, would have lengthen the war by two more years. Or you could argue that those oil tanks saved World War II two more years in the Pacific. Maybe that's going too far. But in any case, most historians regard the failure of the Japanese to destroy the logistics and the supply uh, uh, oil, oil uh, uh, storage facilities constitute a massive blunder of the first order. New paragraph, new, new, new. Uh... Now the Marines now, are embarking on a amphibious operation across the Pacific. And guess what's in the backyard? In the background, it's a battleship. The battleships have now been assigned to give gun support to the Marines. And the Marines, of course, have adopted amphibious uh, fleet and so on, a whole series of requirements as part of their amphibious warfare doctrine, new paragraph. New, new. And here is a picture of the offensive operation across the Pacific, starting the West Coast, Pearl Harbor, and then going by the Marshalls, the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, Tinian, and, and finally meeting with the army, which is coming up through the uh, South under MacArthur, and they're meeting in, uh, in, at, uh, at, uh, at the Philippines. So that was the island hopping strategy that had been recommended uh, by Admiral Williams. New paragraph, new, new slide. The Marines would take an island, the construction battalions of the Navy would then build buildings, storage facilities, uh, tank storage, ordnance uh, buildings, and so on. But the Navy was moving so fast on the fast care task force that, the, uh, that they began to form a floating base, a mobile base, which had been suggested by Lejeune, by Ellis, and by Williams. A floating base in the uh, by a Pacific Atoll. And the base was populated by auxiliary vessels converted into fleet auxiliaries. Uh, and the fleet also had the ability of moving. It went from one atoll to another, from Majuro to Ulithi, to Leyte, to uh, uh, even to the beyond that. And uh, so it, the, the floating base kept up with the fast carrier task force. Next slide. Notice the content 
It was known as Service Squadron 10, uh, which is the logistics side of the, of the Navy. Notice the content of that mobile base. It's, war, it's, it's repair ships, it's tenders, which is a floating machine shop, it's uh, hospital ships, it's cargo ships, it's supply ships, it's mining ships. This list here was the base included the ships that were excluded in the Washington Agreement. And these were the uh, ships that Williams recommended as a fleet subsidiary. Now go ahead, next slide, please. Not only that, but the fleet was moving so fast that in the forward area, they had to go back to these floating bases to get fuel. So now the Navy inverted the process by sending oil tankers to refuel at rendezvous spots for the, uh, in the forward area uh, to the fast carrier task force. And here is a uh, oiler or uh, refueling a battleship, and I don't know what's on the other side, it might be a carrier. But that saved time. That increased the speed and the mobility and the range of the fleet. And in fact, the supply, uh, this, be, this became known as Sevron 6. It would, get its, it would get its oil from Sevron 10, its floating Navy base, and deliver it to the fleet. By this time, the role of Sevron 6 as, as a refueling uh, uh, agent was now altered, and the Navy said, you are now part of a task unit. So these ships were essentially uh, per managed by uh, reserve personnel. They were supplied, they were merchant vessels, and now they acquired the status of a combatant ship. They were part of a task force. Now the next slide. So when the Japanese saw the American fleet, naturally they saw battleships, cruisers, destroyers, uh, uh, aircraft carriers. But the next slide. But what they did not see was this slide. It's the invisible side. It's, a, it's the invisible side of the fleet. You see that one? Oh yes, there it is. It's what the enemy does not see. And notice the list. The list is merchant ships, hospital ships, supply ships, tankers, uh, uh, repair ships, tenders, uh, floating dry docks, tugs. This became 71% of the fleet. The fleet had altered its uh, structure. And the, base, the, the major source of the fleet was logistics. New paragraph. Sorry. Now the next question was, who makes those ships? Well, when the war broke out, the Navy yards were booked to capacity and the private yards were booked to capacity. So the U.S. Merchant Marine, which was created in 1936, by the way, which uh, had passed a bill saying that we will give cash to industrial ships if they buy new ships for their fleet. The U.S. Merchant Marine Act of 1936 also said we will give cash to private shipyards if you make them. What they did in 1936 is what Harding tried to do and what Williams tried to do in 1922. But, so, but the yards are booked. So the US Maritime Commission turns to companies that have never built a ship in their life. Companies experienced in material, in laying roads, in asphalt, in building dams, in building uh, refineries. They say, can you build a supply ship? a liberty ship, can you build a uh, tanker? And they said, yes. And they having no burden uh, imposed on them, they used time and motion study, they used standardized equipment, they used assembly operation, they used prefabrication, they used uh, welding as opposed to riveting. And they blended the whole thing together and they turned out a ship, the first liberty ship was over 200 days. They were turning them out in say 40 days and they lowered the cost by 80%. So these private yards on the West Coast and scattered uh, became the source of the logistic supply and the infrastructure of the mobile base. New paragraph. Now here is the card that 
Williams ultimately played. In 1942, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ellis uh, Johnson worked for the Ordnance Laboratory and he was bored. He asked to be transferred to Nimitz's uh, operation in Pearl Harbor. He, he, he attained the rank of a lieutenant commander. Now this gentleman was interested in mines. He thought mines were more effective than any other uh, type of ordinance against the Japanese. So he asked Nimitz, can we lay mines by planes and block up the harbors of Japan and, and it, insulate them and insulate and compromise their access to raw materials? And Nimitz says, I'm not interested in that. Two years, well, then later on, what Johnson, what Johnson did is he went to the China Burma uh, <coughs> theater, kind of a lost theater of the war, and he convinced the Royal Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force to take these mines and drop them by parachute on the side of China and of J uh, Japan. But not yes, not so much Japan, but China and uh, and uh, the Malay Peninsula. And he looked at the results and he found out that these mines had greater destruction capacity than submarines did or in, in any interaction by, uh, by surface weapons. So he went back and said, you know, it's, these mines are pretty effective. Two years later, 1944, Nimitz is now interested because now they've taken islands across the Pacific, such as Tinian and Saipan, and they put air bases there. And now the B-29s arrive. So the Navy said, could we borrow, or the, yeah, the Army said, we'll use those, those B-29s. Nimitz asked him, we use those to, to drop these mines against not merely the outside, but within the Japanese supply chain. And so they dropped these mines and the mines were very effective. It blocked the harbors. And uh, it, this, this shows you that by 1944-45, you had this, our submarines operating from, uh, this is Australia down here at the bottom. And then you have the uh, Japanese island up here. And you see the beginning of the, the Navy, the Air Force, the Royal Air Force, the Royal Australian Air Force, imposing a economic noose around Japan and starving it of its raw materials. Next slide. The result was that their losses of their ships increased. Next slide. And the next was not only that, but the production dropped because they had nothing to, they had no raw materials. So this was an embargo that had been part of the early Renaissance that, that uh, Williams explored uh, when he was uh, uh, asking the naval intelligence for a profile of the Japanese economy. Your paragraph. Now let's skip that one and go to the last one then. At the end of the war, the United States had a study committee called the Strategic Bombing Survey. And the, the, <coughs> the committee com concluded the war against shipping was perhaps the most decisive single factor in the collapse of the Japanese economy and the log logistics support of the military Navy power, naval power. That's, that strategy included the Army, the Air Force, the submarines, Fast Air Task Force. It was a loose coalition, however dis disparate, was able to create an embargo. And when MacArthur landed in Japan, the first thing he said is send food, they're starving. At the end of the war, when the US uh, interviewed the Japanese commanders and would ask the question, you came sooner than we expected. It was not merely a tribute to the Navy's strategy and performance in the Pacific, but it also was a tribute to a gentleman who, in which victory smiles on those who anticipate. I congratulate your museum for retaining his uniform of a great American and a great tactician. Thank you.
Sorry, I muted. <laughs> I forgot I was muted. So thank you for sharing this story. This story. And uh, if you if you guys have any questions, you can um, ask them now. I just have one question. Um, the I I forgot to jot down his name, but the the man who had was uh, was put in jail. Do you think he played a big role in the underpreparedness of the the United States um, overall? Then would he would that fall? more on his shoulders? Uh, Albert Fall, forgetting about his misstep, it was a blunder, a major blunder, uh, was bought the war strategy of Williams. Uh, he was told, he was informed by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. These oil reserves are part of a war plan and they're confidential. Don't talk about it. You can negotiate with the oil companies, but the rest of that is, is off the record. So to that extent, Fall uh, did make a contribution. Now it's interesting, he lived through the first months of the, first, of the Second World War. And when they neglected to bomb those oil tanks, Albert Fall took credit for it, wanted him, <laughs> him, him to be exonerated. <laughs> I bet. Uh, well, I wanna let, um... Uh, Paul, uh, if you're able to share your screen and start, um, you can tell your story about um, your namesake, Alfred Polk, and the story behind uh, his combat mission. Enough. Can, are you, there you go. And you're muted right now. Okay, I'm up, you hear me? Alrighty, um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you tonight. Um, this uh, story is about um, uh, an exploration that I did with my father starting in 1987 in a search for my namesake's story. And um, hang on a second here. It, uh, starts around a bomber called the B-24. It was a heavy bomber. Uh, there were the most produced aircraft of World War II and will probably remain the most produced aircraft of all time. There were 18,000 of these bombers produced. Uh, at the height of production, they were popping off one bomber every uh, hour out of the plants. And there were uh, four plants that um, were doing, uh, five plants that were producing these aircraft. 20% uh, of them occurred out here where I'm at, which is in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. About 20% of that 18,000 produced here. Um, but the story is not about airplanes as such, such it's more about people. And uh, World War II has people that, from many walks of life that took part in. Rosie the Riveter is certainly one of the most iconic uh, persons that represents uh, the war effort on the civilian side. But uh, old men, young boys, people that were, uh, had injuries or disabilities uh, also took part in the production lines of the war. The airplanes themselves took on personalities um, and, and all combatants had nose art on their airplanes, but the Americans took it to new extremes in, in a way to kind of personify a piece of hardware. Uh, you see all kinds of various forms of nose art. Uh, Walt Disney Company, uh, Al Cap with uh, his comic book series actually used uh, their artists to provide some of this nose art for airplanes in World War II as part of their help of the war effort. And you can see all kinds of pictures uh, here as examples of uh, ones with some of them are girls that they wish uh, were living next door or girls that did live next door, wives. Uh, in cases of uh, the dragon in its tail, they went to extremes to personify the airplane. And uh, some of the artists, uh, Army aviation artists became quite famous throughout the war effort uh, for painting these elaborate nose arts on the aircraft. But it's also about the air crews who uh, flew these things. Um, they operated about 20,000 feet. 
unpressurized, uh, minus 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside, 200 mile an hour winds whipping you. And you'd stand in an open window to shoot a gun out of these things. So they wore heated suits uh, and uh, supplemental oxygen to uh, operate these airplanes. Maintenance people uh, tended to operate outside. There were no hangars in many cases, just hard stands, rain, snow, uh, wind. The maintenance guys had to work on these airplanes and get them up to uh, operational status. And they were far more complex in terms of the radial engines than uh, our jet engines are today. So many man hours went into keeping these airplanes up. This is uh, where I kind of fit into the picture. On the left is Alfred C. Folk. He's age 22 in this picture. He uh, enlisted in the Army Air Forces, was assigned to pilot training, and was checked out in the B-24 Liberator that I showed you earlier. Um, he was my father's best friend. He was born and raised in Springfield, went to Lawrenceville High School, went to Wittenberg, uh, sportsman, uh, but my father's best friend, he was killed in 1944, 22nd of February, 1944. I came along just under two years later and they named me in honor of Alfred Folk. And, and you may have heard me introduced as Paul, um, but I'm Alfred P. Metz. And I grew up being Paul, not Al or Alfred. And I always wondered about that. Um, I had a, a tremendous love for airplanes, as you can see, uh, here, and I don't know whether that was passed on in some mysterious way to me, but I loved airplanes, still do, made it my profession. And uh, you notice here a little one and a half year old kid gently caressing the horizontal stabilizer of my dad's very delicate balsa wood and tissue paper B-25 model. Now, mom said that that model didn't last much past this photo session, but uh, I, uh, I really was taken in by airplanes. Um, and I wondered about late, much later in life, well, why wasn't I Al or Alfred? And I think when I was born, it was, it was uh, January of 46. It was just too soon after uh, Alfred's death. And I think it must have been too painful to hear his name repeated towards a little boy so full of life. Alfred, get out of the mud. Alfred, come in. It's time for supper. Alfred, wash your hands. Alfred, Alfred, Alfred. And I think that was the reason I became Paul instead of Alfred. Um, my father is here on the left. Uh, he was uh, six foot four, and Alfred Folk is right here in the middle. And Dad was large for his uh, for his age for that generation, and Alfred was short for his generation. But they were the best of friends. They met at Tremont City uh, in the softball uh, league out there, and uh, became fast friends. They're uh, about nineteen years old in this picture. And uh, like boys of their age, they like cars and uh, palling around. Again, Alfred down here and my dad over here. I, I thought it was interesting. They're all wearing ties and yet clowning around around a car, a little more orderly and neat in those days. For some reason, my dad was never the basketball player, but Alfred was. And, and there was a lot of kidding around about uh, Mutt and Jeff at that, at that time. Uh, and... Uh, Dad really was a head and shoulders above most kids of his age. Um, I don't know about uh, Homer Circle. I believe he is a News and Sun uh, sports reporter. But we found this uh, uh, article that was in the paper. And uh, Alfred Folk had kept a, uh, a journal with all the clippings from his various sporting events. And after his death, uh, his mom and dad found this up in his room. And they gave it to Homer Circle. And he wrote a very touching uh, soliloquy uh, for Alfred and, and uh, reflected on his time and playing sports. And he was just a young man who gave up all his tomorrows for all of our todays. And uh, very touching. So in 1987, I asked Dad, I said, I want to know about this man. Uh, I don't know anything about Alfred Polk. And uh, he agreed to do that. We spent two years putting this story together that I'm going to tell you. Um, and this is what my father knew, and this is what he told me. He said, Alfred Folk flew B-26s. Well, B-26s were a twin-engine medium bomber. He said their airplane was rammed by a German fighter, and all on board were killed. 
And he had one picture, which you see down the right-hand side here, of Alfred Polk and him, uh, Alfred in his uniform. After two years of ex exhaustive study for uh, looking for various documents, we found out that the only thing that was accurate about that story was the picture. So that's what I'm going to tell you about here this evening. Um, surprisingly, in the midst of 50,000 aircrew being killed in the war and hundreds of airplanes being lost on a monthly basis, there some, they were actually very uh, religious about collecting together the details and facts of each airplane lost, of each person lost. And they are available in the archives, the National Archives, uh, if you so desire to get them. So, for example, I can tell you the serial number of each one of the four engines on the airplane he was in the day he was killed. I can tell you the serial number of each one of the machine guns on that airplane. And it's a level of detail you wouldn't expect to be uh, found in wartime records, but, it, but they, do, they were. I want to point out one thing on this model. Um, this window right here on this uh, right side is duplicated on the left side. It's called a waste window, W-A-I-S-T. And it has one single 50 caliber machine gun shooting out of it. And the gunner standing in that window shooting out and backed up on the other side by the other gunner on the left side. So this is the right waist window, which will figure uh, in the story quite prominently, right waist window. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to discover the details of Alfred Polk's last mission. And just my hobby, I wanted to build a model of his aircraft. So that was our overarching uh, task. We didn't know any more than what I showed you on that first slide. And so uh, uh, Dad uh, at, went to uh, Virginia Trimble, Trimble, who was Alfred Polk's sister, who was still alive in 1987, and asked her if she, he had anything at all of Alfred Polk's. We had nothing more than what I told you. So she went up into the uh, attic and came back with this paper you see on the left side here. And uh, it contains uh, information for the month of February 1944, the flights that Alfred Folk flew. And up at the top, it act and by the way, I want to show you a number of these documents and they are really not readable. I don't expect you to read them and because they, they are secondhand copies in cases or, or carbon copies in cases. I'll tell you what's on them, but just to show you that there's actual documentation behind everything I'm telling you. But this document on the left side is the flights he flew in February 44, and the last entry for the last flight says missing in action, and a B-25J, which is uh, the airplane he was supposedly flying at the time. Up at the top was the first breakthrough we had to begin a much deeper search, and that was the unit. He was with the 47th Bomb Wing, the 376th Bomb Group, and the 513th Bomb Squadron. And that allows you access to records and, and search uh, criteria. About the same time, we went down to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Museum, now called the Na Muse National Museum of the Air Force. And at that time, they let you go up in the library and root around in the documents. And we did. We found this document called the Liberandos Intelligencers. And it was by the 376 Bomb Group organization and they would write these little books. And so it, it gave us a lead that there was a post-World War II organization for this particular bombing unit. The next step in the process was pure serendipity. Dad was a ham radio operator and he liked to get on, on the weekends and search the, the dial and come up with a contact and just talk to somebody else that was a ham radio operator. So one Saturday evening, uh, he was, moving around on the dial and came across this Armed Forces Flyers Network and a guy by the name of Bill Pointer. And they started the normal chit chat. Hi, who are you? Where are you from? How's the weather? What are you up to? And dad told him that, uh, hey, um, my son and I are looking for information about uh, my best friend who was killed in World War II. And um, we we have been looking at it for several weeks and haven't come up with much. And, and Bill Pointer said, well, well, tell me a little bit about it. So dad got a little bit of the story, but as soon as he hit the 47th bomb wing, the 376 bomb group, Bill Pointer said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, I happen to be the historian for the 376 bomb group, and I know a lot of the people, pilots and air crew and maintenance people in the 376 bomb group. He said, let me put out some feelers 
about Alfred Folk and see if they know anything about it. We said, well, that's great. And he said, by the way, what you need to do is write to Maxwell Air Force Base, because that's where the historical research agency is at, and ask them what they might be able to find out about Alfred Folk and this last mission that you're looking into. So we wrote a letter. He started writing letters to his 376 bomb group. Now, 1987 was really 1987 BC, before computers. And so Bill Pointer did most of his work with envelopes, paper envelopes and paper letters. And this is the back of the envelope, uh, one of the envelopes that he would send out. And at the top are the four squadrons of the 376 bomb group. And we know that Alfred Folk uh, was in the 513th bomb squadron, which is the eagle on the dime, black diamond. And down here on the bottom are the list of some of the names of the airplanes. And you can see uh, all kinds of references in there, but four names jumped out at me. One of them was Taking In. That was a, a aircraft of C.C. Uh, Compton who uh, made the uh, run on Ploiesti in 1943. Um, the second one is Lady Be Good, a B-24 that wound up flying into the Libyan desert and were lost. The crew bailed out. The airplane landed virtually intact and uh, was discovered in 1970 by some oil drilling crews. Um, the coffee and the, and the thermoses were still viable after that period of time in the desert, uh, but she was a very famous uh, airplane. Uh, the Blue Streak was the most famous of B-24s. It went on a bond tour in the United States and was the most photographed B-24 ever. The Strawberry Bitch, you can see it today at the museum, the Air Force Museum in Wright Pat. And so these are four of the famous airplanes. And I figured out if Alfred Folk's airplane was in this list, she's amongst fine company. Now, these next ones was a response we got from uh, Maxwell Air Force Base. This is a, called an individual casualty questionnaire. This is for Alfred Folk. And they asked questions and I don't know who answered them because at the time that they were down, no, there were no survivors or thought to be no survivors who could have helped make this out. But in any event, it says, did he bail out? No. Did he have on a parachute? No. And the reason is because the B-24 cockpit, you can't wear a parachute and sit in the seat. So the pilot and co-pilot did not have on parachutes. And the last conversation was on the interphone and he was last seen in the pilot's compartment. And down at the bottom are a list of the targets that they had hit prior to Regensburg, which is the last entry and is the last target at target mission that they were on, was February of 44. This is one of the most pivotal documents, and uh, this is a, a eyewitness to what happened. Uh, his name is uh, Sergeant John Machevich. He is a right waist gunner, right waist gunner in the B-24, but he's not in Alfred Folk's crew. He's in a formation. The airplanes were, um, uh, 183 airplanes flying about 30 foot wingtip spacing, very tightly packed together. And uh, he was observing in an airplane adjacent to Alfred Folk's airplane, which was number ship number 53. And he said what he saw happen was that ship number 99 drifted across and over the top of ship 53 and impacted it somewhere near the waist window, the right waist window, cutting the airplane in two. Both airplanes were, were broken at that time. He saw three men fall out. He said it doesn't appear they had parachutes on. He saw one man come out of the front part of the airplane. His chute opened immediately. He saw no other men come out of the airplane. He watched it as it descended until ship 53 Alfred Folk's airplane finally exploded. Ship number 99 that was also broken half tumbled down in two pieces. And then he said in the report, he had to get back to his gun because they were under attack at that time. So they were at 20,000 feet. Alfred Folk's airplane was 20,500 feet. So he was only 500 feet above him and looking right at it. Now, this is the interesting part. Machevich is a right waist gunner. He's watching this, he's reporting it. I watched. He refers to the airplane of Ship 53 as K.O. Katie. He's the only guy that would know that the, that ship's name was K.O. Katie. And the reason is, is because K.O. Katie, you see her here, is 
the ship of Isaac Ashburn and his crew. And if you look right down here at the bottom is John Machevich, sergeant. So this airplane is normally his airplane, but the whole crew, John, uh, Isaac Ashburn's crew was told to go take relaxation and rest in, in uh, Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, to get away from combat. That's a very normal thing to do. Go rest, get away from combat. So on the day that Alfred Folk flew his mission, the 22nd of February, K.O. Katie was up and operational, but didn't have a crew. Alfred Folk needed an airplane, so he was assigned to K.O. Katie. Machevich, the right waist gunner, was the only one of that crew who did not go to Cyprus for rest and relaxation. John Machevich decided he wanted to fly another counter so he could get his 25 missions and get out of the combat and come back home. So he stayed behind and he was in that adjacent airplane to Alfred Folk watching his very own airplane, K.O. Katie, that morning. The report you just read was he's standing there 500 feet below K.O. Katie and watching K.O. Katie be cut in two right through the right waist window, the right waist window where he normally would have been standing. And I can only think that in his mind in those seconds, he must have thought I would have been a dead man if I had been in K.O. Katie because the airplane was cut in two right through my right waist window where I would have been standing that day. But he wasn't. By the grace of God, he was in another airplane. This is Alfred Folk's crew in the uh, US. He was initially signed to anti-submarine warfare. The Nazis were destroying our shipping right off the coast, east coast. Alfred Folk had a B-24 assigned to him. In gold, down here along the bottom, are Alfred Folk's crew that actually went back, went from there to uh, the desert, Libyan desert, as a crew. And I'll show you the complete crew. These other people are radar operators for this particular airplane. But Alfred Folk is right here. Again, the size differences is dramatic. Alfred Folk was a really short guy for playing basketball. He was a, he was a short guy. This is Alfred Folk. This is not his airplane, uh, but this is all of his crew. And the people in gold that you see here, here's Alfred Folk right here. The people you see in gold are those killed on that mission on the 22nd of February. Two people survived. Fort Quinn right here who's the right waist gunner, and Frank Fox, who is the engineer. Port Quinn survived. He was the right waist gunner. He was the gunner that, that Nechevich thought cut, was killed at the impact. He did not. By grace of God, he survived. He got tangled up in the wreckage. He was in the aft section of the airplane when it was cut in two. He got tangled up in the wires and the conduit and the control cables and couldn't get free he realized he was falling in the airplane. He struggled to get out of the entanglement he was in and in the process realized he didn't have a parachute on. Just at the last second, he found a parachute laying in midst of rubble, grabbed it, put it on, fell out of the uh, airplane, pulled his ripcord and landed at a snowbank. He was captured by the Germans and survived. He came about as close as you can to dying and not dying. The other man up here, is Second Lieutenant Benny Goodman. What a name to have in the Second World War, Benny Goodman. He was a son of a Jew Jewish furrier from New York City, and he was Alfred Folk's normal bombardier, but he had lost part of a finger on the previous mission from a shrapnel and was convalescing. So he was replaced by another man, O'Brien, who was killed uh, as the airplane was uh, cut in two. I had the opportunity to speak to both Frank Fox and uh, Hort Quinn before they passed away. They gave me great insights about the mission they were on and Alfred Folk and it made me, uh, gave me a much better feel for who Alfred Folk was as a man. So those were, those were their letters. The reason they were flying this mission on the 22nd of February, it was called a period called Big Week from the 19th of February to the 25th of February. And it was an attempt to negate the Luftwaffe. The German Luftwaffe was the last impediment to full out bombing of the German Reich. And uh, it had been taking a huge toll on our aircraft. So they dedicated the seven days, the, the week, a big week, and took all of the bombers out of 
England, the 8th Air Force, and all the bombers out of the 15th Air Force in Italy and drove them against airfields and petroleum and ball bearing plants in Germany. They uh, put up 3,300 sorties. They lost 226 bombers and they lost 28 fighters in that period of time. But the Germans suffered more heavily and were never able to recover their strength after the big week of February of 1944. This is where they were at, San Pancrazio, Italy, the one of about uh, a dozen bases that uh, harbored B-24 bombers in Italy. It's on the heel of the, the boot of Italy. And um, this is obviously the runway is right here. And then this area around here are have what I call lollipops sticking out of them, these lollipop looking things. Those are hard stands. That's where the B-24s are parked. That's where the maintenance man lived and worked on the airplanes. You see there are no hangars, uh, but that's, that's the crude conditions they lived under. This is a uh, flight path that they took out of San Pancrazio. They joined up. They had 183 airplanes, 183 bombers on this mission. The 376 bomb group put up 40 of those uh, bombers, and they headed up the Adriatic uh, Sea, crossed into Yugoslavia, on up into Austria, and had an initial point before everybody really tightened up and got in close formation and proceeded on up to Regensburg, Germany, which is right here, and the Messerschmitt plant at Regensburg. That was their target for the day, and uh, 183 airplanes struck it. The collision occurred after the bombs were dropped. They were making a left turn off the target. Nobody knows exactly why ship 99 cut ship 53 in two, but they collided just south of the target area. I had the opportunity to meet a lot of these gentlemen uh, in 1989. They had a reunion in uh, Nevada and uh, quite a group of, of guys. I, they obviously are the, the greatest generation. Uh, right here, you know, with a blue shirt on is Bill Pointer, that guy on the uh, ham radio said, said, hey, I'm the historian for the society, for the 376 bomb group. He's the one we communicated with. He's the one that really broke the, the case of a wide open. So the question is, why were our facts so wrong? I said everything I showed you here on this was, was incorrect for the picture. Well, after the war, they actually found the bodies of six of the eight crew members that died in Alpha Folks airplane. They brought them to the American cemetery in Lorraine, France. And it is typical of the, uh, of the cemeteries that are, you find over in Europe. Um, so when you go to the cemetery and you look at his grave marker, Oh, by the way, one little item here, uh, another bit of serendipity. My name is Paul Metz. He is buried near Metz, France, just outside of Metz, France. Um, his cross read 391st Bomb Group, 573rd Bomb Squadron Medium. Well, that's not right. And I looked that up and the, that group flew B-26 Marauders. Well, that's what my dad said he was flying was B-26s. And I wondered about that because we had the actual information, the correct information. And you can imagine, here's what I think transpired. You can imagine the numbers of airplanes going down, the number of pilots and crew members being lost and killed. And then somebody, a casualty officer and a chaplain coming to the house and knocking on the door and say, we regret to tell you that your son, Alfred Folk, has been killed in action. And they may have actually had incorrect information that was passed hastily from the war zone back to the States. And they probably said, yes, he was in a B-26. Well, none of those details matter to the family or the friends. He was killed, he was gone, he was no longer with us. So the bad information may have in fact been officially transmitted. That's why his cross incorrectly shows a B-26 unit as, as his group, as his uh, airplane assignment. I didn't like that. So, so what I did is uh, I, I took the information I showed you, those documents I showed you, and I sent them over to uh, the cemetery. And I talked to her, wrote to a woman by the name of Martha Sell. Uh, 
And she came back after about six months and said, you're right. The, the cross is incorrectly labeled. And they agreed that the documentation was sufficient to show that he was a 376 bomb group. So today, Alfred Folk lies in the cemetery and properly with the rest of his men as the 376 bomb group, 513th Bomb Squadron from Springfield, Ohio. And the rest of his, the men that were found, they did not find two of the bodies. The rest of the men are buried with Alfred Folk in the cemetery. And prop, they were all properly identified with proper uh, crew. It was only Alfred Folk that was incorrectly identified in the wrong unit. Uh, and of course, uh, Hort Quinn and Frank Fox did survive as POWs and came back home after the war. So there were seven official participants uh, that I, I interviewed and uh, got information from. I hadn't presented all that information, but seven people uh, helped put this together. And uh, you saw the records were official uh, military records. And uh, we had some photos like K.O. Katie was never, has never been published. It was a private photo. And we had phone calls and uh, correspondences on, on the uh, project. And then the meeting I already mentioned in Nevada with 376 bomb group. One of the best things about this story is Hort Quinn. Hort Quinn, when I uh, got a hold of him, he was had, had cancer, a severe case of cancer. Now POWs, all POWs from all wars, get primary care responsibility through the Veterans Administration and they go to the front of the line. They get the best possible care because of their POW status. In 1972, there was a huge repository fire of military records in St. Louis and Hort Quinn's records were destroyed in that fire. So he had no way of identifying himself as a POW. There were no official records. We were able to take those records that we found and present them to the VA and he was reinstated as a POW and got the care he needed before he passed away. So that's, that's what we discovered in the two years of our journey and uh, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Paul. That's an amazing story um, that you were able to uncover and, and, and fill in the, the details and everything. Does anyone have any, any questions? For Paul, you can put them in the chat, or if you want to unmute and ask anything, you're you're welcome to do that as well. Unmuted. Okay, you're not muted. Yes, Dad, Natalie, uh, I, it's really not a question, but Paul has done a fabulous, fabulous job in his research. He should be commended. Thank you. I say it, it's it. I mean, the way everything came together, it's really amazing to see it all, you know, and to realize all the resources that are out there. If you're, uh, you know, uh, and the connections that you were able to make seems really serendipitous how how, how you were able to to connect with uh, the historian and and everything. So that's that's a that's really great. And I'm assuming this is your model. Is this is your model in the picture here? Yes, it is. Yeah. Natalie, um, Marianne, I uh, noticed in your story, and, and Paul, it, it was great the way you portrayed this whole situation. Um, Homer Circle was um, a columnist, as you mentioned. Uh, he had a newspaper article that you showed. And Homer Circle also uh, was a um, alumni of distinction for Springfield City School System. Uh, in the last 20 years, and he um, uh, wrote a uh, book uh, on uh, fishing, I believe it was, and his, um, I can't remember whether she's a daughter or a granddaughter, but Beverly Circle Ingledew, uh sent me a book that uh, Homer Circle did, and I brought it down and donated it to the museum in her name. So Virginia Wygant uh, received that. So uh, that's just a, another little element, uh, you know, where history overlaps. And I just thought I'd bring that to your attention, so. Well, I'm glad you did because I knew nothing about Homer Circle and that's, uh, I appreciate that input. He's also a gifted writer. 
Yes, his uh, book is at the uh, Heritage Center somewhere uh, in the archives. And, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, Homer. Circle. Thanks, Marianne. Sure. Uh, I, I recognized his. I recognized his name, and and Paul. I know that you hadn't contacted about anything about this story because you'd already, un, you know, figured all of this out. But I, I'm curious now. We have um, World War II military cards, clippings from throughout the war that are in an index file up in the archives and I'm curious if we have cards for Alfred Folk and what they say so I'm gonna I'm gonna look those up tomorrow and if I find them I'll send them to you um, but Patty said in the comments just thanks to both of the presenters uh, Manland Paul very eye-opening aspects uh, to World War II that we all need to know about I, I think I think uh, Man Dr. Manley Irwin's uh, talk was very informative and very well researched and gave a background uh, to follow with the uh, following speaker. I think it was a good combination. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good, especially, I mean, to know that we, even since we've just passed the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, um, all of the, the groundwork that he had laid um, to, to prepare um, the US for that. So that was, that was really, um, really interesting as well. Um, Paul, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, uh, switch to sharing my screen now just because I've got a couple last slides that I wanted to share. Um, let me jump down to the end here. Um, just a couple more stories or what that um, uh, I need to stop, sorry, and then go back in because it's not at the right spot. It is not going to my, you guys are not seeing the right slide, are you? I'm trying, I'm trying to go to the one that I see on my screen there. And it's not letting me, anyone has any insight why it's not going to the right slide? I'm trying to go to our, um, there, I might just have to, something is going wrong when I try and go to the, is it There's a different a PowerPoint? Hmm. Is it a different, or is it in the same PowerPoint? It's in the same PowerPoint. Maybe I just and need to close. Wait a second, I know what I'm doing wrong. The other one's open. It's open twice, that's what's happening. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I, I just wanted to um, talk briefly just a little bit about um, the two of our, uh, two local gentlemen. Um, that, have, that were killed at, at Pearl Harbor, um, William Welsh and, and, um, and sure. Dick Ward. I'm not sharing, am I? Okay, let me see. Sorry, guys. There we go. Your current slide. Yeah. There we go. Now I see you guys in the screen. Okay, so um, I, I ran across this the other day, just a, a, a photocopy. I'm sorry, I'm folded up. Can't see it very well, but this is a page from the 1943 Springfield High School yearbook um, that was honoring um, James Richard Ward, uh, Dick Ward, who was killed um, on the USS Oklahoma. And this is the words um, from, from, the, uh, from the yearbook. It says, Houston, Texas, January 7th, by permission of the Associated Press. The destroyer escort ship, J. Richard Ward, named for a Pearl Harbor victim from Springfield, Ohio, was launched here today. James Richard Ward, Seaman First Class USN, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor post posthumously by the President in the name of Congress for his heroism at Pearl Harbor aboard the USS Oklahoma. As the Japanese attacked, he was among those manning a big gun turret. The ship was hit, her generators stopped, and she listed and began to capsize as the order was given to abandon ship. Ward seized a flashlight and lighted the escape hatch for the men rushing up from the magazines. Most of his companions escaped, but Dick went down with the ship. He was a graduate from Springfield High School in the class of 1939. Um, you can see here, this is the um, December 23rd, um, talking about how they, they were still missing in action. Um, and William Welsh, um, he was the first Clark County to join the military after allowing 17 year olds to join. Uh, he immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the local newspaper ran updates about what was happening with local men and um, 
so that people in the area could be updated on just before Christmas. Uh, this is from December 23rd. The families of Welsh and Ward were notified that their sons were missing. Um, in 2016, the family of Billy Welsh was finally able to receive their, clo their closure when his body was finally returned home to Springfield, where he was buried in Calvary Cemetery. And I have... Um, this is here is um, from the newspaper in January when they were launching the ship. Um, this is um, Dick Ward's sister here. And this is the marker that they have for him in, um, in Ferncliff and the USS Oklahoma here. Um, but earlier this year, I got a message just from somebody who messaged our Facebook page and said, did you realize that um, in August they identified um, uh, Dick Ward? So he had been... Um, one, that his remains had been disinterred and um, identified by the uh, defense accounting agency. Um, so I don't know what the next steps are for this, um, but I did see, you know, this had been shared some online and other people were, um, were, were talking about it and were aware of this, but I don't know. I haven't seen anything in our local paper and I'm not sure if any contacts have been made with uh, remaining family or anything like that um, to bring him back um, to Springfield as well. So I don't know if there's anybody on here that has heard anything, but um, I'm planning to, you know, keep an eye on this and, um, and hope to see him return home as well. Um, but uh, another story that I wanted to share just came in. Um, this is some materials that just came in yesterday from um, uh, the family of uh, George Griffin, um, who passed away a few years ago. He had served um, in uh, in Europe during World War II and um, was a, a medic and he had written letters home to his family and the family has donated um, copies of the letters that you can see here on the left. There's about um, 16, 17 letters between 1944 and 1945. And the wonderful thing about it is that um, they transcribed them, and this is this is his granddaughter on the right here, um, has has transcribed them along with um, excerpts from interviews that she talked with him um, about some of the letters, and she went through and she annotated them because he talks about that you know when he wrote home he couldn't he, you know obviously couldn't divulge any sensitive information. Um, so she would figure out the dates that he was writing versus what was going on. So she's got annotations from um, from online, Wikipedia, and um, she, you know, explains, you know, this is what money is worth now today, just, just to put things into perspective. So there's different um, annotations all throughout the letters. So it's, it's a really, um, really interesting uh, resource and a, a really interesting connection with um, if any, I don't know if any of you on here knew George Griffin. He um, he had been in pre-med, which is why he became a medic um, when he um, after he was drafted. Um, he was in pre-med at Ohio State, uh, and he after he returned, he decided not to continue um, his education um, in medicine, and he started working with his father-in-law uh, Bob Rui to and eventually took over Rui's rent a car. Um, which had locations downtown um, that I know some people are familiar with. Um, and he worked there for, uh, for 60 years. And uh, he was part of, he talked, there's a, he, he wrote an autobiography at the beginning of, of the information he talks about. He was um, part of the Roush gang that hung out at the, the old Roush home that was um, next to the Phi uh, Gamma Delta house over by Wittenberg. Uh, and I guess the house had been abandoned um, in, the, in the 30s and they hung out there as, um, as him and his friends hung out there. And he was friends with, um, some of you may recognize the names, um, Dick Kuss, Dick Link, Dick Ward, who had, was killed at Pearl Harbor. They were, they were all, um, most of them were part of the class in 1939 and they hung out together. Um, she mentioned Jonathan Winters was part of that group as well. Uh, and... Uh, I can't remember. Freck Ray was one of the guys' names that, um, so all, all part of that generation that, that hung out together. Um, so it was really interesting to, to get this uh, part of this story from, from someone that was part of that group, and he, he talks about his own experiences there. So um, we're always uh, happy to help people with research and to collect more stories like these. So um, I was really excited to get those yesterday and to be able to share them with people in the future. So. Uh, 
that's all I all I have for, for this. Um, uh, but if you want to, we, we're always sharing stuff on our, we have an Instagram, um, Twitter, Facebook, and we have our, our, our donate uh, page here if you want to make any sort of monetary donation. But as you can see, we, we take um, donations of stuff as well, because that's how we keep the history and, and preserve the stories. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a very informative Thank program. You. Well, thank you guys for joining and thank you so much, Paul and Manley, for being here and sharing these, these um, very interesting stories. And you had mentioned um, that we have uh, the Admiral's um, uniform here. We also have his uh, four-star um, flag uh, as part of the collection as, as well here at, um, at the Heritage Center. So um, we're, we're, we're happy to, to preserve that. and. Um, and everything else that we can do. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting program. And thank you for doing that, Natalie. All right, if anybody doesn't have, if you think of anything later, you can always um, email the historical society or give us a call. But um, thanks again for being here. This is the last program for the year. Uh, we've made it through another year virtually. Hopefully we'll get to do some things in person next year, but we've got some plans for more virtual programs to continue doing stuff like this um, into, into the new year. So we'll have more details once we figure them out, but we've got some ideas. Um, and if you, as, as always, if you guys have any ideas for programs that you'd like to hear, uh, see, or things that you'd like to learn more about, let us know. We'll see if we can put something together or, you know, we talked about doing some round table things in the future, just letting everybody talk uh, about a topic or something. So, you know, if you've got any ideas, we're happy to hear them. So since this is the last one of the year, I wanna wish you guys all Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and let's hope for a great 2022, right? Happy holiday, happy, happy holiday. holiday. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Hey, Merry Christmas. Bye.